Hello, this is Mark Smith with Family Tree Counseling Associates. And I'm on the beach as I'm prone to be down in Palm Island, Florida. My brother has a condo here and he invited me to come hang out. So I'm doing so. It's about 84 degrees and uh, beautiful day, beautiful water. Um, I'm going to be speaking today on the subject too much love isn't really love at all. I believe that it's possible to love too much, too hard, too much energy into it. Examples of this could be an overprotective um, helicopter parent. Another example is a large cookie cutter ethnic family that just looks amazing and wonderful on the outside, but there's not really enough freedom on the inside. There's not enough freedom for people to be who they really are. Um, another example of somebody loving too much is a overly possessive spouse who loves you so desperately that they try to keep a leash on you because of their really deep abandonment fears. Whereas really genuine, healthy, interdependent love is flexible. It's a delicate balancing act offering freedom and emotional intimacy and connection and support. It's not enmeshed and engulfing and too close or smothering or demanding or controlling or possessive. It's also not the other extreme of emotionally cut off, distant, overly independent, conflict avoidant or disconnected. So loving too much isn't really loving at all because it's too much rooted in the unconscious agendas of the person who's giving the love, if you will. Uh, and this could be a parent who was abused as a child, who never spent the time to grieve and to work through those childhood abuse issues, and therefore they are overly fearful that harm is going to come to their children. So they never let their children out of their sights. They never hire a babysitter. They never go away for the weekend with their husbands. And uh, uh, that's damaging to them and is damaging to the marriage. Another agenda could be the social status or the traditions of a family. Many times parents grow up and they've been abandoned or emotionally cut off from and therefore they are committed in their family to closeness and they over they overdo the other way and while they were abandoned they create just a sticky gooey overly close relationship with their kids and with their grandkids and it looks great from a distance but it's not healthy and my office is flooded with people who grew up in overly close families that looked wonderful but they just didn't offer enough autonomy or independence so the fear of a, a spouse who fears uh, abandonment is also one of the agendas that can look like love, but it's really not very loving. So it's not rooted in what's best for the particular love interest. If what's best for your child is they learn how to ride a bicycle like the other kids, then you need to let them get out there on the bicycle and crash maybe even and get a little skin knee, it's not the end of the world. Or maybe a family member needs to move to California. 
or maybe a spouse needs to work in an environment where there's lots of attractive members of the opposite sex around. Um, you need, they need to do what's right for them and real love wants what's best for the person who it's professed to be loved, not some unconscious agenda where people are controlling you and manipulating you and fitting you into their vision of who you should be and what you should be. Kids brought up in too close engulfing families grow up to fit one of two patterns. Uh, so one pattern here is they're distancers, they fear engulfment, they're loners, they're isolators, uh, and they turn up as being somebody who abandons relationships pretty abruptly, pretty ruthlessly. The second pattern is people with abandonment issues who are needy, who are engulfing, who are enmeshing, uh, possessive, who have uh, just a terror of being abandoned. So it's one or the other. So if you grow up in this ultra enmeshed, super close family that everybody thinks is great, they go on cruises, they all get the t-shirts. Hey, 50 of us went on a cruise and we do it, we've done it every year, you know, for 25 years and nobody ever misses. It's not, it's not healthy. There's no place to breathe. So at the core of Everyone who has engulfment issues is the very same terrified, needy little kid that resides in people with abandonment fears. It's just buried deeply under a really hard shell of psychological defense mechanisms. So the people who are distancers might appear to be stronger. They might appear to be less needy. They're just as needy, it's just buried, but it's in there. The unconscious mantra, mantra of people uh, put together with fear of engulfment would be, no one is ever going to control me or trap me or manipulate me or possess me ever again. It's far less painful to be the one who walks away than the one who gets walked away from. I will not give up my power. I will not give up my heart. I'm a rock. I'm an island. I do not need that person who's knocking at the window of my heart. They're going to hurt me. And I would rather shut down and walk away before I get my heart ripped out. People with engulfment fears don't particularly like being touched physically. Now, during the enmeshment time, when they're head over heels in love, they're very needy. They're, they're, they're very needy and they love affection. But once this wears off, then it seems like they become a different person. And they, they don't want their space invaded. Uh, they don't want to um, be consumed or controlled by the, the intrusive neediness of another person. Uh, many times they do fear commitment. Marriage looks like a trap, not like a blessing. Uh, they're definitely gonna get a prenup, no doubt about that, because they wanna hedge their bet just a little bit. They're um, extremely needy at their core, but they rarely feel safe enough or vulnerable enough to show that to you. So the neediness is there, it's just hidden. So deep emotional sharing and emotional intimacy is difficult for these folks. They keep their cards very close to their vests. What they share can and probably will be used against them in their mind's eye, so why take the risk? They have trust issues with the universe. They couldn't trust their own parents, so they're pretty sure they can't trust you. And many people with these kind of defense mechanisms live and die and never really come out from behind their psychological defense mechanisms. So,
these people can be as psychologically dangerous. Um, I've been meeting with a new client this week who uh, got involved with somebody with who has fear of engulfment, and they they saved up uh, hurtful things that this person had done, never said a word, and then dropped it on him. Uh, I don't think we're meant to be together. Uh, we're done. See you later. Which ripped the, the, the fellow's heart out, which is what he signed up for. So let me give you an example. Uh, we'll call this woman Amy. And she, she described herself as having come from a family of the Waltons. And I always throw up in my mouth just a little bit when I hear things like, I grew up with Beaver Cleaver's family, or I grew up in the Waltons, because it's never, ever true. Uh, so I knew that there was going to be really bad marital problems, ugly marital problems, if this woman telling me she grew up with the Waltons, because I knew it was an engulfing and meshed family. In fact, the entire extended family lived on the same block. They named the street after them, in fact. So I knew I was going to hear ugly, nasty, hurtful, heart-wrenching stories, and I did. Because that's just taking family togetherness way too far. You know, you don't, don't need to live on the same block. Um, uh, you know, breathe. Be individuals. Uh, they just loved being together and getting along and having all the fun in the world. So you ask, what's the harm in that? The harm is that not a single person in four generations had developed enough autonomy or independence to fully become a healthy, self-actualized, separate, free-thinking human being. They were all cookie-cut into being a certain way and nobody could deviate in any fashion. Certain careers were uh, accepted, how many children, um, were certainly where you lived, how often you met with your family, it was all predetermined. So Amy's husband, Derek, his side of family was populated with a variety of especially crazy schizophrenics, alcoholics, ragers, and prison convicts. So you look at you look at his side of the family and you go crazy, her side Waltons, and you go, it doesn't make sense, but it makes perfect sense. Because the Waltons are just as crazy as the convicts. Just as unhealthy, just as undifferentiated. From a distance, they look crazier, but they're absolutely not crazier. We always pick somebody who's exactly as healthy or as unhealthy as we are. That is an immutable law of nature. So her glom together, have dinner four times a week as a group, no fighting, live on the same street, we're the Waltons bunch, was exactly as dysfunctional and crazy as his obnoxious Jerry Springer show bunch. They were both voracious, voraciously needy little kids, Amy and Derek, without boundaries, but for different reasons. So there was a whirlwind romance that didn't turn out well. They uh, met and it was love at first sight. They were engaged a month and married in six tragic, insane. Uh, you need three or four years to get to know somebody before you should be marrying them. And much of that time should be spent in some very effective therapy. So it hasn't worked out well for either of them. Derek's been carrying on an affair with a much younger woman for most of the marriage. He can't quit, he's an addict, he's a relationship addict. He's so little on the inside of his heart. Uh, he defines the word voracious. He's an alien insect 
out to consume the souls of his psychological prey. And she's put up with that boundary violation because she says she doesn't want to hurt their daughter, which of course is more enmeshment. Whatever marriage you have, that's what marriage your kids are going to have if you expose them to it for year after year after year. Do you want your kids to grow up and have that marriage? Then desperate times are required. Desperate times are called for, desperate measures are called for desperate times. And if you don't take action, your kids will grow up and have your marriage, I guarantee you. So Amy in this example, she needs to develop a stronger sense of self out of which true and healthy boundaries can grow. And boundaries are just things that help us protect ourselves from being hurt by dangerous, hurtful people. Amy was shocked that her family of origin was the root of her problems because it had never crossed her mind. Not surprisingly, Amy's first marriage and the marriages of her siblings look like carbon copies of her relationship with Derek. Same thing. Too much closeness is very destructive. It's not a good thing. Engulfed too close families only appear to be close and connected, but in fact, they're stiflingly close. That healthy space and individuation is just not permitted. They're sort of like cult groups in a way. The families are smothering, but there aren't really deep conversations or differing opinions or emotional intimacy. Strong are the invisible shackles of guilt, obligation, and loyalty that, mind, that bind enmeshed and engulf families together. Nothing is ever uh, really about the individual. Everything centers on the family as a unit. So enmeshment is really abandonment, disguised, because it, it abandons what that individual truly needs. That's why the Waltons end up marrying people who look like they should be on the Jerry Springer show. So both the overtly abandoned and the covertly abandoned family members act out their primitive neediness issues with drama, emotional reactivity, boundary blurriness, and crazy irrational fighting. So closeness is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. Healthy neediness is the lifeblood of a marriage. If you're, if you're needy enough to ask for connection, that's a wonderful thing. And extended families, uh, relationships can and should go on you know, many years after you're grown up and out of the house and married. But there is a verse in the Bible that says, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. There is a process of psychological different, differentiation that makes it possible for people to launch out into the world and be different and, and establish and build their own legacies, their own families, and still be close to their family of origin. So, uh, working on recovery in relationships means doing a dance. It means getting close, but not too close. Getting uh, enough area to breathe, but not running away and hiding in emotional cutoff. I had the privilege to work with a couple today via Skype who are really advanced. And they're fairly new in the relationship, like six months or so and they're playing with the tension of too close, too far away, too close, too far away. And they haven't quite got it yet, but they're, they're, they're working their way toward equilibrium. And uh, 
that takes time and it takes a lot of dialogue and it takes a lot of conflict and if you're wise it'll take a lot of therapy as part of the program so there you have it enmeshment engulfment it's not love it's abandonment disguised if you haven't joined our YouTube channel family tree counseling please do so um, you'll get notified every time a video pops up we've got 277 I think this is 278 uh, videos of, of issues around relationship and marriage and shame and abandonment and childhood healing issues also visit our website I have six books on the website familytreecounseling.com and there's a book on abandonment and one on shame and one on affair recovery one on marital issues one on the basics of recovery and one on counter dependency for men also I am currently training Dr. Amy Dansby and I don't have loads of room in my schedule and if you're looking for a bargain her fee is just hundred and fifteen dollars an hour whereas mine is 175 and uh, she works very similarly to myself she's really presented herself as somebody who's wanting to learn the family tree way and Mark Smith's way of doing therapy. So you can get her information on our website, familytreecounseling.com. So thank you for watching today and God bless.